Varney the Vampire or the Feast of Blood, Chapter 10. Return from the vault, the alarm and search around the hall. It so happened that George and Henry Bannerwell, along with Mr. Marchdown, had just reached the gate which conducted into the garden and mansion, where they were all were alarmed by the thought of a pistol. Mid the stillness of the night came upon them with so sudden a shock. Involuntary pause. There came from the lips of each an expression of alarm. Good heavens! cried George. Can that be thrown? Firing at an intruder? It must be, cried Henry. She has in her possession the only weapons in the house. Mr. Marchdale turned very pale and trembled slightly, but he did not speak. On, on, cried Henry. For God's sake, let us hasten on. They spoke. He cleared the gate at a bound. At a terrific pace he made towards the house, passing over beds and plantations and flowers heedlessly, so that he went the most direct way to it. Before, however, it was possible any human speed accomplished even half of the distance, portly of a shot came upon his ears. He even fancied he heard a bullet whistle past his head in probably close proximity. His superstition gave him a clue into the direction of all at all events, of whence the shots proceeded, otherwise he knew not from which window they were fired, because it had not occurred to him, previous to the leaving home, quite of which room Fiona, if I would like to be seated, waiting on his return. His right as regard the bullet, it was the winged message of death which had passed his head in such very dangerous proximity, and constantly made the tolerable recklessly towards the open window, which, from which the shots had been fired. Night was not near as so dark as it had been, although even yet he was far, very far from being a light one. He soon enabled to see that there was a room, the window, which was wide open, lights burning on a table within, made towards it in a moment and entered it. To astonishment, the first object he beheld, Fiona a stranger, who was now supporting her in his arms. To gravel him by the throat was a wood work of boat. But the stranger cried aloud in a voice which sounded familiar to Harry. Good God, are you all mad? Henry relaxed his hold and looked in his face. Good gracious, it's Mr. Holland, he said. Yes, did you not know me? Henry was bewildered. He staggered to his seat. And though he saw, he saw his mother stretch apparently lifeless. On the floor. To raise her was the work of, of the moment. Then Marchdale and George had followed him as fast as they could appeared in the open window. Such a strange thing as that small window now exhibited had never been equaled in Banner Work Home. There was young Mr. Holland, of whom mention was already been made, as a fainted lover of Rona, supporting her fainting form. There was Henry doing equal service to his mother. On the floor lay the two pistols. One of the candles, which had been upset in the confusion, the terrified attitudes, the terrified attitudes of George and Mr. Marchdale at the window, could a strange-looking picture. What is this? Oh, what has happened? cried George. I don't, I know not, I know not, said Henry. Someone summoned servants. I'm nearly, I'm nearly mad. Mr. Marchdale at once rung the bell. But George looked so faint and ill as he had been capable of doing so. He rang it so loudly and sufficiently that the two servants who had been employed suddenly upon the others leaving came with such a speed with such speed to know what was the matter. See to your mistress, said Henry. She is dead or has fainted. For God's sake, let who gave me some account of what has caused all this confusion here. Are you aware, Henry? said Margaret Fair. A stranger is present in the room, but Mr. Holland, as he spoke. Who before Henry could reply said, Yes, sir. And maybe a stranger to you, as you are to me, yet no stranger to those whose home this is. No, no, said Henry. You are no stranger to us, Mr. Holland. But you are twice welcome. None can be more welcome. Mr. Marcher, this is Mr. Holland, whom you have heard me speak. I'm proud to know you, sir. Said Marchdale. So I thank you, replied one coldly. It so happened that, but at first sight, it appeared as these two persons had some sort of an 
feeling towards each other, which threatened to prevent efficiently their ever becoming intimate intimate friends. The appeal of Henry to the servants, but no, they could tell him what had occurred. It was answered but a negative. All they knew was they heard two shots fired, and since then they had remained where they were, great fright until the bells rung violently. This was no use at all. Therefore, the only chance was to wait patiently, covering the mother or throne, or which, or one or which, or the other, or of whom was surely some information could be at once been then procured. If Fenwick was moved to her own room, so would Fiona have been. Her son was supporting her. His arm said, "Thin air from the open window was covering her. It's likely to do so." Oh, do not take care. Take her from me after so long an absence, Fiona, Fiona, look up. Do you not know me? You have not given me one look of acknowledgement, Fiona, dear Fiona. Sound his voice seemed to act as the most potent of charms, stirring her from a consciousness. It broke through the death like trance in which she lay. Opening her beautiful eyes, she fixed them upon his face, saying, Yes, yes, it is Charles. It is Charles. She both hysterical floods of tears clung to him like some terrified child to his only friend in the whole wide world. Oh, my dear friends, cried Charles Holland, do not deceive me. Has Fiona been ill? We have been all been ill, said George. All oh, ill? I and nearly mad, exclaimed Harry. Holland looked for some, from one to the other in surprise. Well, as he might, nor was that surprise at all lessened with Fiona made an effort to surrender itself from his embrace. As he exclaimed, You must leave me. You must leave me, Charles, forever. Oh, never, never look upon my face again. I am bewildered, said Charles. Leave me now, continued Fiona. Think me unworthy. Think what you like will, Charles. But I cannot, I dare not, now be yours. Is this a dream? Oh, would I, what would it, if it were, Charles? We had never met. You would be happier. I could not have been more wretched. Fiona and Fiona, do you say these words as so great cruelty to try in my love? Now, as heaven is my judge, I do not. Gracious heaven, then, what do you mean? Fiona shuddered at him coming up to her. Took her hand in his tenderly and said, He said, Has it been again? It has. You shot it? I fired full upon it, Henry. They fled. I did, it did fly? It did, Henry. But it will come again. It will be sure to come again. You hit it with the bullet? Imposed Mr. Marksdale. Perhaps you killed it. I think I must have hit it. Unless I was mad. I'm mad. Charles Allen looked from one to the other with such a look of intense surprise. George remarked it, and said at once to him, Mr. Holland, what nation is due to you, and you shall have it. You see the only rational person here, the child pray, what it, that is, what it is that everyone calls it. Hush, hush, said Henry, you shall hear soon, and not at the present, hold me, Charles, said Fiona. From this moment, mind, I do not, re- I do release you from every vow, from every promise made to me of consistency and love. If you are my child, you'll be advised. From now and this moment, leave this house, never to return from it. No, said Charles. No, by heavens, I love you, Fiona. I've come again. i come to say again, all oh, that in love is time. I said we could joy to you. Then I forgot you. That your troubles may oppress you. May God forgive me. Only my right hand forgot to do me honest service. No more, no more, said Fiona. Yes, more and more, if you tell me of words which shall be stronger than others, in which to paint my love, my faith, my consistency, be prudent, said the man. Say no more. Nay, upon such a theme, I could speak for ever. You may cast me off, Fiona, until you tell me you love another. I am yours till death, and then, with a sanguine hope, and my heart, we shall meet the being, never dearest. To part, Fiona sobbed bitterly. Oh, she said, this is unkindly blow of all. This is worse than all. Unkind, echo told. He do not, said Henry. She knows he's not you. Oh, no, no, she cried. For oh, Charles, dear Charles. Oh, say the word again, exclaimed Amination. It is the first time 
And the music has met my ears. Is that it must be the last. No, 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 for your own sake. I shall be able now, child, to show you. I really love you. Not by cost me, not by cost me for you. Yes, even so. That'd be the way to show you that I love you. He held out her hands wildly. She added in a silent voice. The curse of destiny is upon me. I singled out as one lost and accused. Oh, horror, horror. Would I ever, what, what would, and they were dead. Charles staggered back a pace or two until he came to the table with which he clutched as a bolt. He turned very pale as he said in a faint voice. Is she mad or am I? Tell him I am mad, Henry, cried Fraser. Do not, do, oh, do not make his lonely faults terrible. With more than that, tell him I am mad. Come with me, whispered Henry to Charles. Henry told him, pray you come with me at once. You know all I will. Joe, stay with Fiona for a time. Come, come, Miss Holland. You and you shall know all. And you can come to a judgment of yourself. It's way, sir. You cannot, the wildest freak, the imagined guess of which I have now to tell you. Never was a mortal man so utterly bewildered. The events of the last hour of his existence, as is now Charles Holland. And truly, he might well be so. He arrived in England and made what speed he could to the house of a family whom he admired by the intelligence of their high culture, in one member of which his whole thoughts of domestic happiness as well was centred. He found nothing but confusion, incoherence, mystery, and the wildest dismay. Well might he doubt if he was sleeping or waking. Well might he ask if he or they were mad. Now as after a long lingering look of affection for the pale suffering face of Fiona, he followed Henry from the room. He felt so busy in the fancying of a thousand vague and wild imaginations, which back to the communication which had promised to be made to him. As Henry had truly said to him, not in one of his figures of imagination could he see anything near the terrible screams and horror that which he had to tell him, and constantly he found himself close to with Henry in a small private room, removed from the domestic part of the whole hall, to fall in the bewildered estate as he had been from the first. 